All right. Um, so the first question we have, we're gonna have about a two. We're gonna have two minutes per uh, response, and then after that, for each round after that, it'll be about a minute and a half, ninety seconds per response. Um, so what I think I'm gonna do is the first round, we're just gonna go down the table, and I'll mix up the order after after the first round. Um, so the first question, each of you again, we'll have two minutes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Why do you want to be on the CPS Board of Education? What experience, if any, do you have with um, serving in the community, whether on the board or in other particular areas? And then lastly, any uh, particular comments you want to make about your interest uh, or experience with special ed? So, uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead and start with that? Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Horn. Uh, I'm not from Columbia. My parents went to the Air Force, so I was uh, born and raised mostly in North Carolina. Did my uh, high school right outside of St. Louis in Fallon, Illinois. Uh, moved to Columbia uh, when I attended the University of Missouri. Started working at Shelter Insurance uh, shortly afterwards. I've moved a couple times since, but my wife and I moved back in 2017. Um, since then, um, I've had the I had the privilege of going to Leadership Columbia last year, um, where I was exposed to a lot about Columbia, but my two favorite days were Education Day and Social Services Day. And that's really when the seed for me was planted to, uh, to consider this opportunity. Um, uh, between learning more about our education system, learning more about myself, uh, knowing better, I figured it was time for me to do better. And so that's why I'm sitting in front of here, you here today. Um, I'm really just trying to find an opportunity to, uh, to give back to our community. Um, to make the community the best way it possibly be. What better, what better way to do that than uh, do with our Columbia Public Schools? Time for your birthday. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Jonathan Sessions. Uh, I was born and raised here in Columbia. Uh, I went to uh, Russell, uh, Weston, and Hickman. Uh, I, I think I kind of went to Smithton, but it was opening up while I was there, so we didn't quite have a middle school model when I was there. Uh, after I graduated from the Columbia Public Schools, I, I enrolled at the University of Missouri where I earned a degree in education. Um, while I was there, I actually started my, uh, I started my business. Um, it was at a time where the university wasn't as excited as they are about uh, students being small business owners. So uh, there's a lot more support structures there and I'm happy to be a part of those now. Um, I, I started my business, so it was an IT consulting company uh, that's grown into what it is today. So it's uh, about 17, 18 years uh, that I've been doing that. Um, when uh, I'm actively involved in the community, uh, I'm a member of the chamber. I, I'm the coordinator of Education Day, so I'm feeling pretty successful on that. Um, uh, and I've, as a part of the chamber uh, and uh, the liaison uh, for the chamber uh, for the Board of Education, I've actually represented the Columbia Public Schools on, on four of our leadership trips where we um, visit other communities and, and bring back uh, great ideas such as the um, the uh, dinner, the federal subsidy uh, for uh, free dinners for students, or the early college program, which I have an opportunity to talk about tonight. Um, as far as community involvement, I, you know, I've been born and raised, and I'm, I'm deeply involved, whether that's been in city commissions or youth groups or choirs that I've directed. Um, why I'm running, I'm, I'm running for um, the same reason I've always run. Like, Columbia wasn't, Columbia Public Schools was an integral part of my success. I am who I, I was today, as, as challenging of a student as I was in the Columbia Public Schools. Uh, I am who I am because of the Columbia Public Schools. And uh, 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to give back, uh, and I was thankful the community uh, gave me that chance, and has given me that chance several times over. Um, as far as uh, special ed, oh, uh, uh, thank you all. <laughs> Pass it over to Helen. That's good. I like just it. Just wait. They get better. Oh. And you're going to want to talk, though, because of these. I know. It's just going to be fun. I'll wait until you're ready. Oh, we're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Helen Wade. Um, I have been on the Board of Education for nine years, and I've lived here in Columbia for 26 years. And of those 26 years, I have spent the last 15 practicing family law, um, both personally and professionally. Columbia families are the center of my life. Um, I cannot express uh, you know, loudly enough the role that public schools play in the lives of the families that I interact with every single day. Um, I ran for the first time nine years ago when my daughter was starting kindergarten. Um, like every parent in this room and every parent in the community, I wanted my daughter to have the best education she could possibly have. I wanted her to have a foundation upon which she could build a successful life for herself and her own family one day. 
I'm the product of both public school, private school, and military school. Um, and I understand how important it is to um, have a strong public school system, both personally and from a community perspective. I've been very proud to serve this community on the Board of Education. Uh, it's a wonderful job. It's a difficult job. And we face very challenging and complicated issues. Um, over the next three years, that's not going to change. We're going to serve the community in the way that we can do best. We're going to address the issues of growth, managing our finances, managing our student population and the shifting needs that each and every student has. We don't have the same group of kids every year, and it's our job to make sure we meet those needs every single year in the ways in which they need to be met. We need to focus our district on equity among our buildings and our students in a way that's truly effective so they can be the recipients of a second to nine education because they deserve it. Uh, my name is Helen Wade, and I'd ask for your vote this April. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Seaman. I am a uh, Columbia transplant. I'm from uh, the other Columbia, as it's now known, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, my family moved here in 2003. Uh, myself and my wife were Rockbridge graduates. I went on to graduate from Columbia College and then joined the Marine Corps as a logistics officer. Did about five years in service out in North Carolina, actually. Uh, once it was time to get out, we decided that we wanted to come back to Columbia because this was, this was home. This had become my adopted home. Uh, this was where we wanted to raise our three kids. So we came back and we decided to pursue lives of service to others because this is where we got our foundational start. The reason I'm actually sitting in this seat is because of the great people at Rockbridge High School. They guided me to where I am today. So coming back was an opportunity to provide the same opportunities I had to the kids that are in school now. So I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, is that volume all right on this one? Can everyone hear? Up a little? Is that better? Okay. All right, then, then after that question, the rest of the questions will have a 90-second time limit. Um, and in this, in this uh, particular question, we're going to go reverse order, so start at the far end of the table and come back towards me. The question, uh, just to give a little background, SEPTA was formed to help special education parents and teachers uh, to interact and get the services and get the uh, focus they need in the school district. Uh, one of the things that has been proposed over time is a special education parent advisory panel, CPAC, or I guess it would be council, sorry. Um, what are the ways that you would expect or like to see special needs parent or parents with special needs children um, or the folks in SEPTA interact with the school, interact with the board, and what is your role, uh, if you were on the board, what would your role be in making that happen? So I currently serve as a board member for ACT Services here in Columbia. It's a nonprofit that provides uh, residential living assistance um, and a day program for folks with special needs and disabilities. Um, I've been on it for two years. It has been an eye-opening experience. You have parents who come in, they talk to the board every once in a while and they'll, and they'll let us know that how much they appreciate what's happening with ACT. Um, I view the CPAC as almost the same idea. We have a board here, a board of education. Um, we can provide this opportunity for these parents to be a part of the decision-making process. It, it wouldn't be difficult to do. We're doing it at ACT now. So, um, as a board member for the Board of Education, um, I view my role the same way I view it on the board as ACT. Uh, we're there to advocate for our, what we call them clients at ACT, but our students here, um, and students and the parents, uh, our teachers as well, our parents, all, everybody involved in that process. We're there to support them. So I think one of the things that's changed probably the most over the last year or so during my tenure has been the degree to which we have had uh, interaction with some of your members. Uh, Michelle and Robin in particular have spent quite a bit of time with our superintendent um, and have played a vital role in crafting of some of our new policies and in helping us understand what we as a district need to do better. Um, so the short answer to that question is 
we have to be able to talk with you and meet with you and to hear from you the way in which you've been willing to talk with us um, and provide us some of the insight that only you have as parents. Um, in terms of the specific uh, idea of the Special Education Parent Advisory Board, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think that uh, the more uh, focused input that the Board of Education and the district as a whole can get from um, parents who have different experiences within the district uh, will provide a foundation for a better district. Um, I think that it's uh, what we do on a daily basis changes and um, our focus as, uh, as a district as large as this one, we're the fifth largest in the uh, state at this point, um, sometimes we need to have that focused input so that we, we can look at the things that matter to each group. Um, every single one of our kids is really, really important, but they're not the same. Uh, and hearing about their differences sometimes makes us the best district we can be. I got to see it. Your, your meme game. Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I, are you ready? Is he scrolling? I'm just trying to turn but we'll just I'll do that. I got it. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I've said from from uh, on the board uh, that I think this would be a, a great way um, to to increase communication, increase, increase discussion, increase like, the facilitation of, of, of solving issues. Um, it, to start, we're a governance board. Um, we we don't micromanage our staff. We're not we're you know as board members we're not there on the day to day. We're not in in the buildings day to day. We work, um, especially board leadership works directly day to day with the administration. But we're not there. We're not the boots on the ground. We're not the administrators. We're not the teachers. And so an, an organization like this uh, would uh, or a CPAC would um, would definitely help. I believe facilitate some of those discussions and um, and, and and help. Um, help answer some of the questions or some of the frustrations um, that, that parents are having, the teachers may be having, um, that it, I think that it would be beneficial. I'd say like the, we talked just, um, uh, Robin and Michelle, like that meeting that we had with the superintendent the other day, I think it was incredibly productive because we were able to have a discussion. Um, you know, I, I get how frustrating public comment can be. It's public comment. And I can, I've you know done it from the, my the other side at like a city council meeting or even before I got on the board at board meetings. Like you go up there, you say something, and seven people stare at you because it's it's public comment, not public discussion. So I think an organization like a CPAC would totally um, help um, with that discussion part. That's good to know. <laughs> Do you have enough for every question? Well, if you're the only one who uses them, maybe. <laughs> um, to me, uh, when I hear the idea of having uh, an ombudsman or a CPAC, um, from the outside looking at it, it almost represents a gap in communication um, from the ground level. Uh, the conversations I've had, it's not that um, uh, parents are having issues or having any problems with the educators or the or the, uh, the parents or the people that are servicing their children. Um, there's a there's a gap in communication between the service that they're receiving and then when they have to get to the to the public board. Um, so to me, uh, I'm all about dialogue and transparency, and so I think it's utterly important to have conversations and to have open dialogue and to build rapport um, because the board, in my mind. Um, are advocates for. So we're advocates on behalf of our educators, we're advocates on behalf of our students. And so um, who better than to have open dialogue than the advocates that are on behalf of the students with special needs. So I think that um, while it's a good idea, um, I think a better idea is to have open dialogue and not have to get to that point where the, uh, the public forum has to be used to have that issue addressed. Thank you. So. Um, in the interest of full transparency, as an actuary, my job is to make things fair but complicated. <laughs> so uh, this round will be, uh, try to look at my notes, Jonathan, and then Helen, and then Chris, and then David. So uh, you'll each get a turn to go wow. in all the turns, but I would like to make it as complicated as possible for you. <laughs> so 
Um, a, a few of you uh, touched on this, so I think it's, it's worthy of, of further discussion on this next question. But what exactly uh, do you guys that are, uh, you know, as you're running for this role, what do you view your role on the board vis-a-vis -vis the superintendent and uh, whether it's uh, setting direction, responding to direction that's been set by someone else, but, but are you there to serve the superintendent? Is the superintendent there to serve you? Who, are, who, who do you view as your most uh, you know, important constituents, that, you know, that sort of thing? Superintendent works for the Board of Education, period. I view as being a board member, um, we have three big levers to pull. Uh, that's the budget, it's policy and procedures, and that's hiring and firing a superintendent. Um, the superintendent works for the Board of Education. Uh, we evaluate the superintendent. We choose to extend or not extend that contract. Um, so that's, that's how I view the board's relationship to the superintendent. Um, um, from a technical standpoint, Jonathan's completely right. Um, the hierarchy is basically that um, the board's sole and only employee is the superintendent of schools. And it's the board's job to um, supervise, to evaluate, uh, to um, you know discharge, or to, and to hire superintendents. Um, when Chris Belcher stepped down um, or retired, uh, you know we went through that process with Dr. Stevenson. Um, there was a, a question about whether or not the board's role to take direction from or to give direction to the superintendent, and I think my answer to that is probably that it's bilateral. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a teacher. I don't have a PhD in education. Um, my my probably foremost qualification as a, uh, in that world is that I'm a parent, right? But I don't know the ins and outs of how a school district can be run in order to serve each student in the best possible way. Um, school finance is a very difficult and complicated topic. I've learned a lot about it over nine years. So the reason for that. Uh, speech really is that I need to learn from those that have the professional qualifications and that, that do this work as their job, right? Like, but um, I can provide something that they don't have and that's input from the community. Um, I can give my perspective. I can listen, I can learn, and I can, to the degree um, I am able, be a conduit. Almost as <laughs> I feel like you can show the audience as well. Yeah, he, he threw us off, man. Actuary. <laughs> Whole page dedicated to order. <laughs> um, I, think that, I think that question is fairly simple. Uh, yeah, the, the board essentially is the boss of the superintendent. Um, I think the board is responsible for setting the, the mission, the vision, the goals um, for the district. And I think those missions, visions, and goals need to be uh, decided based off uh, the data that we receive on how our district is performing and on the input from the community. Uh, like Helen said, I'm the same way. I work for an insurance company. We can talk about insurance all day. I don't know that I need an advocate to represent insurance, but um, when it comes to education, we need several advocates. And so we need input from the community, and that should drive uh, the decisions the policies, the missions, the visions that we have. And then it's incumbent upon the board to hold the superintendent accountable for um, achieving those missions, and visions, and goals. So I agree with the other three here. I would also say that the board's role is to advise. Um, I have different life experiences. I live in a different environment than Superintendent Stiebelman, then Helen, then Jonathan, then Chris. We all live different ways. Um, and there are always blind spots that you may not be aware of. So you're there to help the superintendent along with that mission of educating our students so that they can go out into the world and be productive citizens. Uh, my constituents would be the students, parents, and teachers of Columbia Public Schools. That's who I would be there to represent their interests. I'd be in the room uh, advising the superintendent on what those interests are. And if he disagrees, then he disagrees. But you have to be there to say, hey, this might not be the best idea, or this is a way that we should go here, or this is how we should address this group. Um, it, it, it's 
it's something that you learn in leadership. Every people aren't always aware of their blind spots, and sometimes it takes someone else in the room to point those out, so that we don't make those mistakes, so that we can be as successful as possible. Thank you, everyone. All right, so now will be even a little more confusing, but that's okay. So uh, we have Helen, and then we'll have Chris, and then David, and um, Jonathan will be last on this one. See you. See your pattern. I have to mix it. I, I have time for my pocket, so I can mix it up. But um, yeah, everyone probably in the front room will know this question is coming or something related to it. But uh, there's been a lot of debate over the last year around recording of IEP and 504 meetings. Um, you may know there's a bill working its way through our legislature. There's also a work group at uh, CPS that is addressing this issue and, and, and studying this issue. So I think, uh, I guess the simple question is where do you stand on uh, recording of those meetings? I had no idea we were going to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it coming. Um, so I want to be really clear that I'm speaking as myself. All right, I'm a candidate for you. I'm not speaking on behalf of the board here, okay? Um, I think this is a complicated issue. And I have concerns um, about implementing a new policy by being the very first district in the state to do so. Um, I know our teachers are nervous about it. I'm recorded for a living. It's what I do. I know that every time I'm in the courtroom or I'm, I'm in a deposition, I'm being recorded. I'm aware of that and I know how to talk about that. It's a skill. And I don't think that our teachers who are, you know, 24, 25 years old, who are willing to get into special education are ne necessarily as well equipped for that circumstance as I am. I think that uh, the legislation that is being proposed is legislation that could really change things statewide. I don't oppose that legislation. I don't oppose it at all. But I do think that in considering our district as a whole, that it is prudent to consider what might happen if we have wonderful special education teachers who may find a way to go to Southern Boone or Hallsville or Harrisburg or Jeff City, if we're the only ones that have that policy in place. I would like to see it happen statewide, and I am willing and hopeful that what we're doing within the district now with our work group in terms of logistics is a pattern that can be followed by other districts as well. Um, like I've shared with many of the people that I've met throughout this process, uh, I've got a steep learning curve, right? And so the first time I heard about this was one of the first board meetings I attended, and then the uh, subsequent first time I had actually, actually had a chance to talk about it was meeting with, uh, with Michelle and Tara. And my initial response to it was, that should happen. Um, you know, I, I had not sat in a room where these IEP meetings are taking place, but my understanding is um, no matter how long they take um, as a parent, you're already emotionally invested in what's going on with your child. And so regardless of what language you're equipped with, what skills you have, what experience you have, um, that's automatically gonna take your attention. So if you're in one of these long meetings and you're trying to remember everything that's taking place, uh, I can only imagine how difficult that is. So my initial response to it was, I mean, these things should happen. Um, I understand there's opposition. Anytime you have a tough policy or tough issue, there's gonna be opposition, but what are we really talking about? We're talking about providing a service that's beneficial to our children. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know maybe oversimplifying it, but really that's what it comes down to. When we're talking about providing or implementing policies and rules, we should start there. And if it's going to provide a benefit, then we figure it out. So I have two children in CPS, and when we go to parent-teacher conferences, it's my, me and my wife were sitting there and we're listening. It could only take 10 to 15 minutes to get through that conversation. As we walk out the door, we may look at each other and say, I don't remember what we talked about when we talked to Draven's math teacher or his science teacher, because we've already forgotten. Some of these IEP meetings last almost three hours long. We're asking parents to try to remember everything that's been said. 
So, yes, I agree that we should allow these recordings to take place. It would be difficult to do if we were the first in the state, but that's what we're here for. We're here to make the hard decisions and navigate them. If we're not going to do that, then we shouldn't be sitting in these seats. On the flip side, I understand why some of these teachers are nervous. You put a recording device in front of someone who's never had that done to them before, and they get nervous, and they feel like they might say something incorrect. In that situation, we need to provide them with the support and training so that they feel comfortable doing so. If they feel, if they've gone through that training and we listened to the recording and they were professional and courteous and they didn't say anything incorrect and litigation is brought against them or a complaint, they need to know that the school district has your back in that instance. So yes, you can be professional with that parent. You can say the things that you need to say in that room. If it comes up again and they have that complaint, we've got your back and I love Okay, now I need a seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in ways, I agree with things that everyone said uh, up here. Uh, I, I, I will start with the same practices. My opinion is my opinion alone. I understand I am a current board member, but I, when I'm a board member, I'm a member of the body, and right now I'm just I'm a candidate. Um, it, I can only imagine, because I've not participated in IEP meetings, uh, how stressful uh, and emotional that can be, especially for someone um, who's going to those meetings for the first time. Um, remembering that, I, I understand that. Um, and uh, so, so I understand the desire, I totally, um, I totally understand it, and I empathize, and I, I, I get that. I, I, um, I truly do. Uh, um, I also am not opposed uh, to the state legislation. I, um, at, at the same time, and I, I think that uh, a lot of, of David's comments are, are very valid. We, we would need to provide training for a lot of our teachers, but you know, I'm up here and there's cameras all around the room pointing at me, but I signed up for it. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of our teachers that didn't. And so they've expressed to us um, in, in surveys we've done that they have a lot of reservations. So I understand that. And so, you know, I Thank you, Robin, for providing us in advance with some of the questions we were going to ask. I point you to number 10 about staff shortages. And when we're the only, if we were the only district to implement this, um, and uh, we would then be in a level of competition with a lot of other school districts, and I worry that those staff shortages would only increase. And that's a big concern I have, and I don't want that to be. That's why I'm, I'm totally okay with it being a state right now. Thank you. All right, we're going to go back to uh, just straight down the line. One, two, three, four, because you know it's time for that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know my um, <laughs> the next question will be about uh, district classrooms. I think there's a few issues here, so let me just hit some highlights of what you might want to, you know, address in your response. Um, there, there have been some inclusion concerns around uh, inclusion of regular ed peers. There have been uh, events that uh, special education students are not always included in in some of these events. Um, and, and I think one of them, even uh, maybe more challenging, but also more important, is what role do parents have in the decision-making process uh, as opposed to just being told what a decision was that was made? Uh, where, where do you guys come down on those particular issues? So um, I mentioned earlier about setting missions, visions, and goals. Um, and you know we've got to be guided again by community input but we've got to be guided by a, a spirit of inclusion and you know when we're talking about these sort of things we're still talking about tough issues but we have to be guided by what's best for our kids and what's best for inclusion um, i guess the best way for me to illustrate this is kind of the feeling that i had i went to visit the uh the Early Childhood Learning Centers uh, today in the North uh, Division. And um, they talk about how in their pre-K program uh, for their children with special needs, they invite children in there uh, that would be subjected to what we call general education and they have integrated classrooms. And what I thought was really cool about that is, you know, you're, you're developing these little humans to, to work with and be with people that 
maybe they wouldn't have the opportunity to do that with. And that's mutually beneficial for all kids there. And so um, I think that sets the model. Again, we're talking about a really large district, so I understand the scale there. Um, I understand it's, a, it's it can be viewed as a dream, but it is a model with which we can follow. I would lean on something like CPAC to help help steer a lot of those decisions. Um, again, like as, as board members, we're not elected to be SPED specialists. We're not allowed, you know, elected to be teachers. Um, we're, we're elected to, to govern. Um, and so we're not experts in these fields. And so there are, there are a, you know, when it comes to questions of education, it's about that back and forth where we count on our qualified staff. And at the same time, we need to make sure that those discussions are including parents. Uh, so when I think, you know, back to some of our previous discussion here this evening, I think a SEPTA group that could, I'm sorry, a CPAC, get all our acronyms correct this evening, uh, a CPAC could could help us in in decisions um, when it comes to things like, because you, you've got a long list of the things you provided, but things that are on there like um, where we have um, geographically specific programs, where those may be located if they need to move. Um, um, when we're talking about um, programs like Quest, where we're working to uh, help students build the self-regulation skills that they need, so they can re-enter into a general classroom, like, we need we need parent input as we make those decisions, and and, and that needs to be part of that relationship between the staff, uh, the staff and parents. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the question first, and then I have something to just want to say. So having children who have special needs attending the same classes in the same classrooms as the general education students should be and should be the standard. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Chris said. That has an absolute in, an intangible and exponential benefit for both kids. Um, every kid is unique. But sometimes, you know, the more unique, the better. Um, and every kid should have an opportunity to interact with every every other kid as much as possible. In terms of um, the geographic, Jonathan said it well, the geographical location of specialized programs. Um, the district is uh, needs to balance the requests of parents with respect to presence in specific buildings with the ability to properly meet the needs of each individual child. So there's my direct answer. You know, um, over nine years, um, my, let me say my first campaign, I wanted to, I wanted, I did say, I want to do, yes, every parent ought to be able to have their kid where they want their kid to be. And every kid should be in the classroom that the parent think is, thinks is best for that child. Um, and we ought to be able to do these things. And it's true, but I'm here in front of you to be honest about what I think about these things and what I think is possible. Um, and one of the things that is possible is to truly work together and collaborate to meet the needs of each of our kids with the input and insight that you all can provide to us in a way that's better than we do now. A step forward is better than standing still. So while you're not hearing me say, yes, let's do it all now, I am saying, there's work to be done, and I'm willing to do it. I almost want to go over time just so I can see all this. <laughs> 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 She'll let you look through a <laughs> So I went to a Columbia First uh, meeting uh, last week, and I met a Rockbridge graduate from 1990, and he was a part of this program. And the way he described it was uh, almost like modern segregation. And it was jarring to hear him say that. Uh, and it was heartbreaking. Um, I agree with everyone here. Our students, our special ed students, should be in the same schools and classrooms as their the friends that they have in their neighborhoods, their siblings. Uh, we shouldn't be segregating them into other programs. There is a reality there, though, that uh, of a lack of resources that we have to address. Um, and I think that's a driving factor. It is something that we all want to see. It is a goal. 
it is a lofty goal, but it is one that we should be setting a target date for. We should be looking ahead to figuring out how we can get to that point where we have these resources in each school um, so that these students can remain in their schools with the people that they, that they live with. Um, because at the end of the day, I'll tell you, as a, as a member of, of, a board member of ACT, uh, our residents, they have that socialization because as they get older, just like any other kid, there are things that you're going to have to learn. And if we are keeping them in certain areas away from the general population, to say, um, you don't develop that socialization. socialization. We're, we're failing them later on in life. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, yeah. So I'm going. I'm going to tee off one more question here in a second. But I just wanted to remind everyone in the room: if you have uh, write-in questions, for lack of a better word. Um, Michelle can get you a note card and we can take some of those um, in a minute. Uh, this next question, we're going to start uh, down at David's end of the table and work back towards, excuse me, work back towards me. Uh, seclusion and restraint, a uh, couple, uh, couple key topics there, and again, just uh, want, want your feedback and your views on that. Uh, obviously, the key issue of seclusion and restraint, um, and, and again, there's a bill working its way through the legislature, but also... Um, there seems to be a, a Chinese wall between uh, CORE and CPS, and who, who ultimately is responsible for the kids that are in that program, or, or where do you view that, that responsibility to lie? All right, so I'm just going to say it outright. I, I do not agree with putting uh, children in these rooms whatsoever. Um, like I said before, I have two children in CPS. Uh, if I were to come home and find out that they were in those rooms, I'd be extremely upset. Um, I'm saying that. That is an in-game solution. What we should be doing is looking months ahead of time as to why is this, why do we feel like we need to put this child in this room? What kind of trauma have they gone through that's gotten them to this point where a teacher feels like they need to call someone to put them in the room? Um, if we put the resources in that school in the form of counselors and therapists where we can address those things ahead of time, the entire room issue doesn't exist anymore. We've treated this student Put a child in, put a child in timeout all right I put my son in timeout if I don't address why he's in timeout then tomorrow we're going back to timeout and next month we're going back to timeout and next year we're going to timeout so if we don't solve the problem at the beginning then we're not helping anyone out um, I will tell you that when I played football in Rockbridge you know, we took charter buses across the state to go play games you may be on the charter bus that the school does not own but you are still, the school district is still responsible for us. So if you got in trouble on that bus, the school district can still get you. If we have students at core, they are still our responsibility. No one else is. Until they go home to their parents, they are the responsibility of coming to public schools. All right, again, I have no idea we were going to talk about this tonight either. Um, seclusion, restraint, and isolation is a, an emotional topic for every single parent, and no parent, no teacher, no student wants to have physical contact with a teacher. Um, there's not a teacher within CPS that wants to put their hands on a child. Now... When I heard about the legislation that was being proposed, um, obviously I followed it. I've heard a lot from many, many families about this issue. And as, I, as with the last question, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Legislating away seclusion, isolation, and restraint does one thing really well. It changes who does it, not whether it happens. I think what's important here is to recognize that there are ways to intervene with students that should be uh, done in every circumstance and that any kind of isolation, any kind of restraint, and any kind of seclusion, certainly, should be an absolute last resort. And if it's not, then our teachers haven't been trained appropriately to respond to those circumstances. I know how much our teachers in this district care about our students, and not one of them wants to put any of our students in harm's way. I will say also that, you know, um, our students shouldn't be coming into contact with law enforcement when they are having problems at school. 
That's the last thing that we want to do. And allowing our teachers to have the appropriate training and the appropriate circumstances to respond to those problems as a teacher so that student can stay in the classroom, isn't homebound, isn't outside of the district, is something that should be an overarching goal and something we should be uniting behind. I'm out of time. I have a lot more to say on this topic. But I'm out of time. I love Lucy references a little. Have you lost on some? I um, uh, I, so I think the policy that the Columbia Public School Board just adopted uh, regarding uh, seclusion, which again prohibits seclusion and helps clarify that, is a good example of how we can all work together. Uh, that was a policy that, Robin, we worked with you and got your input. Um, we were looking at it during a board meeting. A question was raised. Um, it was a question we hadn't thought of, and uh, there was an expert in the room who shared their, their thoughts. And we paused. We gathered everybody together, um, made it better, um, made it now as um, as as best you know as we've gone through it with the legislator now the legislation always changes but as it is now it's very much in line with uh, the legislation that I've seen and so I think that's a really great example of how we can work together to make it better um, yes I agree seclusion should as it is per board policy currently and previously it should be prohibited um, um, as I said a minute ago our goal should be to help students build the self-regulation uh, skills necessary that many of us have, that, that in some ways and shapes and forms we've all learned um, through through our socialization life experiences or been actively taught by, by family and professionals. I want to find ways through, through the programs and through our relationships with um, organizations like High Roads and Focus and make those strong relationships that we can all be uh, be in support of to help us get to a place where students who who are not able to be in a general ed classroom can get the skills that they need to get so that they can work their way in back into that that general popular that general classroom that general education classroom sorry stop is that Jack Black so uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with advocates and parents of children who um, who attend CORE. And um, the policies um, we're working on, that's good. But really what we have is a, a fundamental, fundamental misunderstanding and lack of inclusion. Um, you know, the stories that I've been told, you know, some of these kids shouldn't even be subjected to being in this building. Um, you know, and I won't get into details, obviously, but uh, so there's that. You know, really, we have to work on the relationship between our students and our teachers. So, um, when we do have these practices, um, they're absolutely needed for absolute last result issues, and not um, not be used in, in place of restorative practices. Um, and I'm I'm working on getting into core. So if anybody here works there, I reached out. I'll reach out again. Um, if somebody can help facilitate that. That'd be great. Um, and you know, from my understanding, from catapult, um, again, that's part of my journey. It's part of my learning. Um, if it's necessary, okay. But if we're going to have to contract these services, then they need to be held to the same standards um, as our CPS staff is. Thank you. All right. Uh, for the next question, we're going to uh, find my piece of paper here. We're going to go with uh, Jonathan, then Helen, and then Chris and David. Uh, these are some questions that I've gotten from the audience so far. Uh, so I will paraphrase them a little bit. There's a lot of common themes in some of these questions. Um, uh, just just to uh, to read a little bit from one, uh, the candidates have given some great thought to how they plan to promote a culture of inclusion and kindness in CPS for children in special education. A lot of these are big picture ideas which are important, but do not change the environment on a day-to-day -day basis. If you are elected, how will you help improve the lives of children in a special education uh, setting on a day-to-day -day basis? Jonathan, you're up first. Oh, yes, sorry. I confuse you if you want. No, 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 that's all right. I'm just making sure I understood. Um, 
So as I, I mentioned earlier, the, the Board of Education is, is, is not, we're, we're not a, a, we're a governance board, we're not elected managerial. So on, on a day-to-day, -day, the Board of Education isn't in building, I mean, we may be in buildings, I was in several of the days, in fact, but uh, we're, we're not there directing staff, we're not there instructing teachers, we're not there making demands of, of leadership. So. Um, when I think of how we can make change on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to make change through governance. We need to make sure that if there's questions about policy, that we clarify them. If there's questions about whether or not that policy is being implemented, that we determine that. And um, if there needs to be a correction, we make that correction. Um, that's how we can make change on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, building uh, a relationship where we have everyone in the room and we can, we can actually make sure that, that we're, we're asking the right questions or we know to ask the right questions, because again, we're a governance board. Um, so we may not know all the right questions to be asking. So it's about building those relationships and making change where it needs to be, be made from a governance level so that we can see it the impact day to day. Um, so, I talked to a really smart guy um, some time ago about some of his experiences um, from his wheelchair. And he told me a story about how he'd go to a hotel and at times he would, the bed would be too tall. And so here he is out of town and he can't get in his bed. It's a day to day experience. So, from my perspective, things that I can do from a board level is to make sure that kids can get in the doors, that they can reach the tables, that they can um, have a place to rest, that they can attend the assemblies, that they can um, find themselves uh, in their own place and belong in every single room of the building in which they learn. Um, their interactions with their peers can be cruel. Um, I was always a new kid, so I was always the target of all kinds of uh, jokes and teasing and whatnot. I grew up with a very strong accent, and so um, I get what it feels like to be different and made fun of for being different. And addressing that to me does start from the standpoint of including children who have special needs with children who have um, similar needs with children who are in the general population because it builds that rapport and acceptance from the beginning and makes them a little bit less different. Um, so, that was not a great answer, but it was mine, so. Who's <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, You know, one thing that we can do, uh, particularly, you know, with the bond issue coming up, I know ADA uh, compliance is one of the big things with that. Um, but I like, you know, the idea of having ADA inclusive. So what, what I mean by that is there are some of our elementary schools where you go to, um, they've got playground equipment that is designed for kids with special needs, kids with wheelchairs, ADA inclusion, so they can play with other kids. Uh, but really, from a, from a board perspective and from my perspective, um, it's about proving day to day. We go back to inclusion. You know, right now, the CPS is giving equity inclusion training to all their educators and their administrators board, um, which I think is fantastic, uh, but we need to build upon that. You know, we talk about improving day-to-day -day, um, uh, experiences, particularly for our special ed kids, particularly for kids of underrepresented groups. Um, we have to foster an environment of inclusion, and, you know, the hard part about that is, you know, in order for that to really work, people have to take individual journeys. Um, but if we foster that environment, if we create an environment where we retain people, retain educators that are about that, um, we make that the norm, um, we're really talking about improving everybody's experiences. So your student will spend eight hours every day at school. Theoretically, if they get eight hours of sleep at night, which we know most kids don't, for whatever reason, um, they will spend as much time with their teacher in that classroom as they do with you. So the direct answer is the best way to support these students on a day-to-day -day basis is to hire, support, and retain 
the best qualified teachers possible. They will make a difference in their lives, just like you will make a difference in their lives. Um, it's you know, everything else that everyone said is is highly important, but that teacher in that classroom will almost decide what happens when your, your child's fate in a certain sense. Um, how they grow, how they progress, how they socialize, just like you will. So hiring those teachers, supporting them, and then keeping them here in CPS is the best way to support those students on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Um, we'll have one more question, and then we'll have a chance for all of you to make sort of a closing statement, not quite a closing argument, Helen, but in that vein. <laughs> uh, and this question will be, uh, it will start with Helen, and then Chris, and then uh, David, and then Jonathan. Um, it's, it's really an amalgamation of a few questions and, and some of the things that were touched on today uh, around funding, and uh, there's a bond issue, as, as everyone knows. I will not pretend to be an expert on how all these things work, but there is a rollback waiver that apparently was uh, chosen not to be undertaken. Uh, is that a possible, I mean, obviously maybe too late at this point, but what do we need to do to provide the resources to the teachers, not just for the special education folks in the room that have their needs, but for all students. Uh, how do we solve this funding problem, or how do you view your role in solving this funding problem? Um, okay, that's a lot of questions, so let me take, <laughs> take the first one first. Okay, prophecy rollback. Um, this is, right now, we are, our fund balances uh, have been purposely built uh, so that we can open the new middle school. And I don't think that it makes a lot of sense for our voters to be asked to add to those fund balances right now, given where we stand. I don't think that that's, um, I don't think that's an ask that the voters would agree with. In even-numbered years, though, uh, we can request a proxy rollback, and we can take uh, that money to add to our budget to do things like improve teacher compensation. I expect that to be something that the board is going to continue to discuss, and as a board member, I would want that to be part of our budget um, in 2022, which is the next opportunity we have to make it a part of that budget. Um, this is something we've talked about a few times this year, um, and I think it's something that we, we're going to need to do. Um, you also asked what is a board member's role in, in school funding in general. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to talk to our legislators, and we have an opportunity to make our opinions known. Um, I've been to Jeff City, and I've talked to many of them, and I can tell you that it is our job to continue to say as loudly as we possibly can from the seats that we occupy that it is time that you fund schools fully and in the manner that they are treated as the single most important publicly funded institution that we have. Um, and if we funded it that way, I can guarantee you, we'd be really, really proud of the entity that we have. Right? Chris. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm with the proposition to see rollback, I agree with Helen. Um, you know, really, to me, it would be a matter of you know how much money would we really generate with that, and is it you know balancing that versus leaving that with our taxpayers? I, so for now, um, I, I, I don't see that being necessarily being be on the ballot. Um, but as far as resources go, you know, a lot of the conversations that I've had, particularly with a lot of our principals, um, a lot of our educators. You know, we're, we're very, very resource rich in this district, um, uh, it, but maybe there's some questions about how we allocate those resources. Uh, I think a lot of the things that the district is doing is fantastic. You know, we talk about nature schools, high school casinos, these things are great, um, but they're only as good as um, our students have access to them. And so, you know, while we're, we're spending a lot of money with these things, and like, like I said, they're all great opportunities and we should not stop doing them. Um, but while we're doing that, we're still forgetting about some of our underrepresented kids. So um, I think the resources are there. Um, it's a matter of are we properly allocated? So I think Helen is right. There is a timeline for when uh, these issues will come up. I think what we are not so much failing at, but what we need to strive to do better is actually communicate uh, adequately when they're going to come up. So when people don't hear about 
uh, a, prop a prophecy rollback coming up or, or when it's going to happen. Um, in the absence of communication, you essentially think that nothing is going to happen. Um, and that perception becomes reality in your mind. So uh, adequately, adequately communicating those issues to the public, to parents, to teachers, um, it is an easy route to take. Um, and, and I agree with, with Chris, having gone through Columbia Public Schools, we are a resource rich here. Um, we are allocating funds in areas that are highly important, and sometimes people don't agree with those. Um, but that is a part of the process. You have to bring in a number of voices so that, once again, you're communicating with everybody and everyone gets that say. And when everybody walks away from the table, maybe we're not, are not happy with where those resources are going, but we do know where they are going and we understand what the next two to four to six steps are down the line. 90 seconds for all that. Um, so the prophecy rollback actually happens every year. It's part of the calculation when we set the tax rate in August, which we're statutorily obligated to do. We do it every year. Nobody remembers when we do it when we roll back your taxes and you pay less, but everybody pays attention to the news article when we increase them. Um, it is done in a calculation. It is, it is a, there's a form you can download from the state website right now where you can load in the numbers and do that prophecy calculation. It's a, it's a sales tax rollback, so if sales tax goes up, you get a little bit of money back on your, on, on, we'd like, we roll back the rate that we um, are assessing on your, and like your AV, your assessed valuation. Um, that's a real quick summary of how it, that works. The rollback, or like the waiver would be, we would ask voters if they would like us to, like, we would ask, like, can we have a waiver from this as a taxpayer? Um, and that waiver would then, we would stop doing the proxy rollback, so we would just set set the rate based on other other factors in the calculation. 30 seconds, I'm not gonna really wrap this up. Um, so that's what that is. Again, we are 11 cents, 11 cents under our ceiling, as Helen said. Um, so on even number of years, as we adjust that, we, we're not only do we have a high fund balance with the intent to open up a middle school, we also are 11 cents un under what the voters have approved when it comes to, can you tell I've been on finance committee a lot, uh, under what the voters have approved for, for their tax rate, what you all have said we can tax you at. So then bond issues. <laughs> That's I, the best one. Yeah, that is pretty good. Um, <laughs> You know, I'd like to think bond issues, can I have just one moment on bond issues since I haven't gotten there yet? Uh, the, the, we have bond issues, like, we're, when we talk about planning, like, every, has everybody seen one of these at some point over the last 10 years? We have, this is about long-term planning. And when we think about, like, things that we've done every day, I don't even think about the things that we've done every day. When I got on the Board of Education, we had 175 trailers. Next year, we're going to have 20. On Wednesday, I met with a young man at Russell Boulevard Elementary School talking about governance, and he shared with me the story of his friend who couldn't go to music because he was in a wheelchair, and music was in a trailer. And as a music educator, it kind of pissed me off. Um, so I get it. Um, but you know what there aren't at Russell anymore? Trailers. We're down to 20 when we open up our, and, uh, John Warner Middle School. And, and those are the kinds of things that we can do, and we, but we can only do them with the community support. So for that, I thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, for this last uh, section, we will start uh, down at David's end of the table, uh, 4321, uh, as you're seated. And it's really a, a two minute uh, opportunity for each of you to, uh, what I'd ask you to do two things, any sort of closing comments you want to make, and also if there's something that you really wish I would have asked because you wanted to answer, um, <laughs> is this is your opportunity to say that. So education has always been an important component in my family. It kind of starts with my grandmothers. Um, I have one that has a PhD. She's 80 years old. She still teaches high school in Columbia, South Carolina. And she uh, put, as a single mom, put three uh, sons through college. So she understood the value of an education. The other one uh, worked in a poultry plant for 30 years. And as a single mom as well, put three children through college. And that permeated its way down to my parents. My mother graduated from the University of South Carolina. Uh, my father went to Wake Forest, Tufts, and Oxford, um, and they instilled in myself and my brother the value of an education, so much so that my sophomore year of high school, my mom walked out onto the practice field at Rockbridge and pulled me off the football team. 
because my grades weren't good enough. It was a humbling and embarrassing experience that I would never forget, <laughs> but I got the message. That message led me to Columbia College, to the Marine Corps, where I learned a very valuable uh, trait, and that is we are here to serve and protect those who can't serve and protect themselves. And in this case, those are the students, parents, and teachers of Columbia Public Schools. So that is why I am running, to ensure that those students have the same opportunities that I have, because not all of them do, to ensure that those teachers uh, are supported and feel supported when they're in the classroom and that we can retain them, and to ensure that the parents are heard and that their issues are acknowledged and addressed. My name is David Seaman. I appreciate your vote on April 7th. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak before you and every group that we get to speak in front of during this time. Um, and as I was sitting here, I was struck by the fact that this is the first time I see you every, like, seemingly daily. <laughs> but this is the first time I feel like I've been able to talk to you. It is, because we never talk. I always talk at you. Right. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Um, it's a good thing to, to talk and to share ideas and to share um things that can bind us together. That's why I'm running. You know, public schools, not just Columbia Public School, but public schools can serve every student in a way that no charter school, no private school, and no voucher program can. We can meet the needs of your kids, my kid, and everybody else's kids the best. We have the resources, we have the teachers, we have the ability to do it. But we've got to bind ourselves together and unify around the idea that public education is, like I said earlier, the single most important publicly funded institution. Uh, it's the thing that differentiates us from others. Columbia is a stronger community because we have a strong public school system and because we have had such incredible public support for the district for the duration that I've been on the board. I think that we do face challenges that I'm willing to face with you. I'm not always going to agree with all of the things that um, every group believes is right, but I will listen. I'll be honest with you about what I might be concerned about and what I think might be a better idea. Um, I said earlier I have a lot to say about seclusion, isolation, and restraint. I can assure you that one of the things that I have to say isn't, gee, I think it's a great idea to do it. But I think there are solutions out there that we're not looking at, that we're not talking about, because it is an emotional issue. I think that my experience on the board has led me to understand in a way that you just can't understand until you've been there, that evidence and database decision making is the only way that you can really make equitable decisions about what is right and how to deliver the best education to every single one of our kids. That works best when we also have that community input and that, that bilateral communication that I've really enjoyed this evening. So my name is Helen Wade. I too would appreciate your vote on April 7th. And I will say everybody who's sitting up here today would be an asset to the Board of Education. You have your own. Wait, can I can I talk over you? Now? <laughs> um, I, I will keep it brief since I went long last time. Um, I'm Jonathan Sessions. I asked for your vote. No, I'm, I'll try it. Um, I, I don't typically need a microphone either. I usually have just an outdoor voice that works pretty well. Uh, I asked for your vote on April seventh. Um, as Helen said, and, and she is almost always more eloquent than I am. Um, I, it's difficult in, in a business meeting uh, to, to have a dialogue. Um, but when we sit down together um, and we're in a, in a space, named the friends room, uh, I think we, we can realize that we, we can see eye to eye on a lot. And there are gonna be moments where it's like, oh, no, I disagree on that one. Um, but there's gonna be a lot of stuff that we're like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I can, I get that. Let's let's move forward. Let's make this happen. Let's um, let's solve this problem together. 
And as a board member, that's, that's one of the things that I've strived to do. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've, I've fought so hard for uh, equity and inclusion, um, changing policy, uh, making sure that sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression are included under protected classes for staff, teachers, and students. Um, that was not something that was on the board when I found. Um, I'm the only board member that's a certified equity trainer and works within our district to help all of our teachers and all of our staff uh, and all of our administrators understand that we were all socialized in the way that we were socialized. Um, and, and that's not wrong um, how that socialization happened, but maybe some of the biases we got uh, and uh, some of uh, the thoughts that we have um, need to change. Uh, and that's a, as, as Chris mentioned a minute ago, like that's a, that's a personal journey. And that's why that works hard. That why that, that's why that work takes time. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. So I thank you all for your time tonight. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I ask you for your vote on April 7th. Uh, we've looked around. I've seen that one. <laughs> thank you all for having us here this evening and uh, hearing us speak. We really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, uh, service is something that I'm committed to. Um, and I think when you uh, serve on the Board of Education, obviously you're serving the community. Um, I have the privilege of serving on the Heart of Missouri CASA Board, which uh, advocates for some of our most uh, at-risk youth. Um, I have the privilege of uh, serving with on the Advisory Council with the Inclusive Impact Institute, which is making huge changes in our community. Um, I got, the, I got the honor to uh, work with Junior Achievement uh, at Mill Creek. Um, and every other Friday, you can catch me at, at True North um, work, working with their, uh, their individuals on um, resume and, and job training. So, you know, when it comes to service, when it comes to trying to make an impact in our community, it's something I'm committed to. Um, in addition to that, you know, I have extra motivation. You know, my wife works in Columbia Public Schools. And so I get the privilege of seeing her on a day-to-day -day basis um, just pour out for, for our youth and the kids that she serves in the classroom. Uh, I've got little humans that are going to come through our, uh, through our Columbia Public Schools district. So, um, you know, while I want to see that, uh, see our district be the best it possibly can for, the, for my kids, I want to see it for all of our kids. Um, you know, so I'm really committed to equity and inclusion, you know. Uh, we have to continue this training that we're doing, build upon it, make it, make, I don't want to say mandatory, but we really have to really put the resources behind it until inclusion becomes the norm. Uh, a huge support of our teachers. Um, we need to foster an environment where we can recruit and retain quality talent. Um, you know, we need to have open dialogue with our educators to make sure that we get them the, the work environments, the working conditions that they need without compromising the resources that they need. Um, and lastly, um, I'm all about early childhood education. You know, uh, we have a lot of kids that arrive to kindergarten that don't know how to read, don't even know how to sit in a classroom. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but if we can expand the reach of our early childhood programs, and we can give every kid the opportunity to arrive to kindergarten ready um, and completely change the trajectory that they have throughout their education journey. So that's the work I'm committed to. Uh, that's why I'm sitting here in front of you. I thank you for your time. I'm Chris Horn. I ask you for your vote on April 7th. Thank you. I want to thank all the candidates for being here tonight, and I'm going to turn.